Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I am on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Morjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, Cultural Creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. I'm Adam Hill, and this is Your Superior Self. Adam, my man, thank you for taking the time. Uh, thanks I, for having me on. I, I just I um, received your book and started reading that, and it's fabulous. It's so fascinating to read, like you know, not just one story, but like the the story of a dark, you know, your dark night, right? Like the dark night of the soul, and then what you did to get out of that. Like it's, it's so fascinating to read what people one are going through and then what it is to pull them out um yeah let's talk about that right like um your background like tell everybody you know about you know what's the title to your book and you know what was the premise yeah yeah so the title of my book is called shifting gears from anxiety and addiction to a triathlon world championship and my history with anxiety really started when i was when i was young of course uh without really knowing that i had an anxiety disorder I, you know, experienced most of childhood, which would be, you know, considered a privileged childhood. I had two great parents who were married to each other and a middle-class family that was, you know, loving and supportive. And I had really no reason to think that anything was wrong with, with me, but, you know, inside there was just this budding and deep, uh, festering kind of fear and, and everything that, that was coming up in my life. And, and, you know, that, that would manifest itself in, in small ways. Like, you know, I would have social anxieties. I was afraid to interact with some other kids or, you know, I would wet the bed or, or, or I would be, you know, just appearing as something of a spaz. And I, and I always just thought I was that just a spaz. I didn't know what anxiety disorder was. I, and we didn't really talk about that kind of stuff back in the early eighties and nineties. Uh, but, uh, it really only started coming to a head when I got into college and when I started to, you know, dabble with alcohol and start drinking. And I started drinking early in the college experience, just pretty much with, with everybody else using it as more of a social lubricant. And I found really quickly that it was a, it was a solution to my social anxieties, to all my fears, to everything that was, it, it was just, if I didn't know at that time that I had some kind of anxiety, it was like at that moment, because I felt like I was like, oh, you know, this is a new level for me. You know, this is, this is exciting. This is fun. I feel loose. I feel like there's no, you know, inhibitions or what whatsoever. And so I immediately saw this, that as a solution. And I didn't see it as a dangerous solution because at that time there were no consequences. And I didn't really feel like I had a family history of alcoholism. There's no reason for me to suspect that it would become a problem for me. Uh, and, you know, that first experience I had with drinking when I was in college, I, you know, had three beers. Uh, it was actually before college. It was before I actually went to the university. But I had three beers. I walked home to my friend's dorm room and I went to sleep at a reasonable hour and there was, you know, nothing nothing bad happened. And then that continued for the course of, you know, the next year or so as I got into college and, and, uh, and it, it was, you know, it's one of those progressive things that it starts to, you start to experience some of the problems. And I started to experience some of those problems just in small ways. Like, you know, the, the police would be outside and they'd see me holding a beer and then they would bust me for it. Or I would, blackout one night because I drank too much or something like that. And, and so it was starting to, it was, it was still a solution to those anxieties, but it was now a solution with problems. And, um, over time, when I got into my late teens, early twenties, I started to experience really intense panic attacks. Uh, I remember my first panic attack was when I was studying for an exam, which, you know, would cause a panic attack for a lot of people, but it was the first experience with anxiety that actually told me, Oh, Oh crap. I've, I've got a problem here. I've, there's something different about this. Uh, you know, I was studying for an exam and, and all of a sudden it just hit me like a ton of bricks that I was sick, that I, uh, somehow contracted, you know, this disease. And I thought I had HIV at that time. It was just like, you know, but there was no reason for me to suspect why 
that would be the case. And, but it, but it paralyzed me and it caused such intense fear that I thought I was going to die, but I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I just sat in the floor in the fetal position, just crying. And, um, and I knew that it was ridiculous. I knew that it was irrational, but I couldn't justify that in my mind because my mind kept telling me that it was real. And, you know, so I went through the process of, of going to the doctor and getting the test and finding out that, no, there's nothing wrong. There's, you, there's nothing wrong with you. You're fine. And, you know, sure enough, it would replace itself next time with, wow, I think I have this form of cancer. So it was this intense hypochondria that was causing panic attacks. And the one thing that would help me to overcome that anxiety or to, or to suppress it at that point was to continue to drink, to drink into, you know, my, my state of oblivion. And so for the next decade or so, that would be the game I would play with my anxiety is, you know, to, in order to suppress it, it would be panic attacks. It would be just general anxiety. I would continue to drink uh, to, you know, the point of intoxication in order to uh, suppress the anxiety and, and make sure that it didn't take over. Uh, and that, that was really the genesis of how my anxiety came about um, and, you know, how my, my drinking uh, and my alcoholism came to be. Mm -hmm. What, what age was that? That was approximately between 18 and, uh, uh, 32 is when I finally got sober, but, uh, there, and there were bouts of sobriety in there, but, uh, uh, but primarily that, that period of 14 years or so. What was, the um, you know, everyone goes through, I think that, 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 that part in their lives where they're in college, right. And they're experimenting with alcohol and then they, you know, I, I, me too. Right. Like, you know, uh, I, I started drinking, you know, like college age. I didn't really drink in high school and in college definitely binge, you know, had fun mm -hmm. with that binge drinking and playing cards and doing all the, you know, posting 30 packs all over the wall, like, you know, and it's not healthy. Right. But it's, it's just a part of the culture, right. Like that society says we go through, um, right. and then, you know, uh, carry that over into, uh, early twenties, mid twenties, late twenties. Um, and then as I, you know, I got married and had kids, you know, socially drank right on weekends. And now I'm, you know, I, I, I don't drink. I don't, I, um, I'm 38 and I don't, not because I don't want to, not because I don't have that craving It's because like, I like, I know some people battle with addiction and at some point, yes, I probably was, I probably could have been clinically diagnosed as an alcoholic with the amount that I was drinking. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can still feel it in my body where there's weekends. Like if there's a hot summer day and I just get done cutting the grass, like I, 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 I can feel myself like wanting to have a beer. Like there's nothing better than that. A nice cold Miller light after you get done cutting the grass, like there's nothing, you know, right. I, for me right now in my life, like the drinking, like, for me doesn't allow me to tap into parts of myself right like for me it's meditation it's it's tapping into my spirituality it's it's being the best version of myself and it doesn't allow me to do that like i'm not re i'm not tapping into flow states mentally if i if i am drinking now i'm not an extremist it's just my personal preference like i you know i've lost a lot of weight i'm a, I'm a runner I work out. I don't have a gym, but I have a kettlebell, a 35 pound kettlebell. And I do push ups and sit ups and, you know, some other exercises with that, but I run mostly, um, nothing crazy. Like the most I run is like 10 miles. Mm -hmm. I, I've dropped weight. People think that I'm like, I, they come up and they're like, are you sick? I'm like, no, I'm not sick. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just working out. Like I, and I cut, I don't sugar. Like I have three kids. Yes. There's sugar around my house. And yes, I, I occasionally eat a cookie or something. But my body, man, like when you get rid of all that crap, like your body, you feel it, man. Absolutely. You know, like you were talking about in your book, like um, when you were getting rid of like the hamburgers and cheeseburgers and all of that artificial stuff, like your, your body, you could feel it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was, that was really that second transformation that I had. The first transformation was obviously getting sober. I mean, I went through a really, really dark bottom that had ended up, uh, uh, you know, it ended up going a lot darker than, than I ever imagined I, I would. And it, it got to a point where I was just out of, where I knew I was out of control. I know I had no control over my drinking. 
And when you mentioned the, the idea of like, wow, that a beer sounds good on the weekend, even to this day, you know, just my brain as an alcoholic, it just doesn't go there because it goes to the idea of, yeah, that first beer sounds great. It, you put it on a pedestal, and it's frothy and it looks beautiful, but my mind immediately goes to what's beyond that. And it's just an infinite loop of alcohol beyond that because there's, it's never enough. Mm-hmm. And so it's never enough for me to, to, uh, to, to want that. And it really came to a head when I, uh, you know, I, I'd always set a number of rules for myself to convince myself that I didn't have a drinking problem because that's kind of what, what we do to make sure we can keep up the charade. And uh, I, one of those rules was don't drink and drive. And that was the one rule that I never broke, never wanted to break because I hated people that did that. And, you know, one, uh, but eventually I did. Eventually I did drink and drive and it got me into a DUI accident. I was arrested for it. And, and immediately the shame that came with that every, every, um, you know, feeling of, of just, I didn't deserve to be on this planet anymore kind of came into light there when I was sitting in that jail cell. And, and it's at that moment of the rock bottom where the two choices really come to pass that choice of, I can either, you know, because I, I, I'm out of control, I have no control over this. I'm not only just a danger to myself now, I'm a danger to other people. So I have the choice of I can either end it right now or, you know, and just take myself away as a burden off of this earth, or I can actually just lean into getting help and just do whatever they say and just surrender completely to that process, which is what I did. And that, you know, obviously that was a, a, a difficult, but also very, um, uh, the most rewarding thing that I've ever done in my life was to get sober because that immediately took, you know, and, and doing so through a framework, through a program of sobriety, I went through Alcoholics Anonymous, but there's a lot of different programs that people can go through. Uh, but doing it through a framework really helped me to not only get sober, but to, uh, but to discover ways to manage and work through my anxiety and eventually even, realized that that anxiety, that the pieces of those, that anxiety was actually a superpower. Uh, you know, that, that anxiety for me came with an obsessive, you know, amount of just, just a personal obsession. I was obsessed about everything. I, and it, you know, borderline OCD and I, you know, but I could use that obsession in a positive way, turn it into obsessive focus so that I could get into that flow state more, more effectively, I could turn it into discipline, or I had, you know, just a very strong sense of, of the, the, the environment around me. It's very, very high self-awareness. I considered that a superpower, but it, but it manifested as anxiety. And the second that I reframed it, it turned into something that could be useful, something that could be of service in some kind of way and, and, and helpful. So after about a year of sobriety, after working through that, uh, that's when I, went toward my second kind of transformation, I realized, Hey, I, I'm, I did something that I thought I could never do. Uh, I got sober and I'd always heard in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that you should never make any major life changes for a year for your first year of sobriety. And what I took that to mean was after one year of sobriety, make a major life change. And so I went and I, I, I just, I was like thinking through that. And uh, that's when I decided to really change my physiology, my physical body, because I, I healed my, I'd gone through so much effort to heal my mind and spirit. And through that, through that year, but my body was still a mess. I was still just drowning myself in junk food and, and just terrible habits, smoking cigarettes and doing all that. The alcohol was gone, but I, I needed to clean up my physical body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you, would you, at that point in your life, would you ever consider yourself an, an athlete? Absolutely not. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I think in the book, I described myself as a second string bench warmer for a high school baseball team that went, oh, and 10. That's where I was from the athletic scale. I, w- I was not an athlete. <laughs> so that's, that's just that is so fascinating because the, you know, after sobriety right now, like, I think you went to Hawaii and, and after a year, you kind of, um, slid back into that. Yeah. You slid back yeah. into drinking because of, um, you, you were on vacation in Hawaii, right? Like one of the most fantastic places to go. And of course, you know, you're in, you're on vacation and you're like, why not have a beer or why not have a drink? Right. Because I'm here. 
right? And I've done right. this on my own, right? Like you did AA, but you, I think there was a, a piece of that where you're, you weren't really following any, any um, guidelines, right? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And that happened before my DUI accident. I was uh, uh, maybe a few years earlier bef before that I was, uh, I had had these moments of sobriety where I could get, I could be sober for maybe a, a week, two weeks, maybe even a, a few months at a time. And for a period back in 2006, I was, I think I was sober for about uh, eight or nine months. And uh, uh, we had a vacation planned to Hawaii and we were going to the big Island and we were staying at the Royal Kona resort, which if you've ever seen the landscape of, of the big Island of Hawaii, it's the, it's the resort that sticks out there. And, and, you know, it, it's the scenic hotel that's there. So we were staying there and I remember, you know, that we were sitting in a, in a lounge, um, you know, just overlooking the Pacific ocean uh, and, you know, everybody else was drinking Mai Tais around us. And I was just thinking to myself, that would be great. I had yeah. that same thought you were having. It's just like, I, yeah, I just, I want to, I want a Mai Tai. So I manipulated my wife at the time to, to, you know, just be in favor of, of that with me. We could have so much more fun if we, if we, if we're both just enjoying a drink, you know, translate that into, I'm going to be a miserable sack if, 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 uh, if I can't drink while, while we're here, I'm just going to be, but you know, that's, that's the, that was the terrible part of it. And so of course she relented and I drank and that, you know, got me into it. And I didn't know it at that time, but I was just a mere 200 yards away, or, you know, maybe a little bit more, maybe a quarter mile, four, 400 meters away from the start of the Ironman world championship that happens every year there. And that would become very, very, uh, uh, you know, apparent, uh, uh, of course, later in my journey. Sure. Um, so that's, that's interesting. That's the interesting part for me. So you go from this, uh, second string bench warmer for an O and 10 baseball team to, uh, writing a book about your journey being in you know, an Ironman, right. World championship in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, you're, you're not, I mean, there's two things, there's two battles going on here, right? There's an inward battle and there's a outward battle. Like, a, yeah. there's an external goal and an internal demon, right? Like there's a fight. Yeah. Um, you know, do, do you ever get, you know, do you ever slay that internal, you know, dragon? Right. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like that's a battle every day Yeah. You know, with sobriety, right? Like uh, with that addiction, with addiction, it's like, you never, do you ever truly win that battle? I mean, I think you slay it. You just take one day at a time, just like a marathon, right? Like mm -hmm. a, like a Ironman. I, I was looking at the, the, the numbers for those, you know, like mm -hmm. two, two mile swim or 2.4 mile swim or something like that. A hundred and what is it? A hundred and something mile bike 112, ride. Yeah, 112 mile bike, 26 then, um, mile, 26.2 miles. Like I'm yep. looking at the numbers and I'm like, if I look at the numbers and add them up, that is way too big for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Same right. thing with sobriety. I look, I'm 38 and I, you know, I got, you know, hopefully I got another good 40 in me. Um, but if you look at the larger picture, like it could, it can feel overwhelming for people, right? Like yeah. you got to take it one day at a time, one mile at a time. You mm -hmm. know, when I'm out there running, it's, you know, I'm not looking at 10 miles. I'm looking at the, the first step, you yeah. know, that first mile is a mother. You know yeah. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> if I ever, if I ever write a book, it's going to be called the first mile. Like the first everybody, mile. everybody should know what that means. Like that first mile is a mother. It is. Yeah. But, I a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so true. Um, and you know, you, yeah, that, that first, I mean, whether it's your first week or your first year in sobriety, it, that's a, that's a mother. I mean, that, and you know, for me, it was going in and being there every single day, being present in that every single day, being obsessively focused and recognizing that that became my superpower with that obsession that drove me to drink every single day, drove me to be present in, in AA every single day. And, uh, and then, you know, it eventually drive me later, but that, that was hard. It wasn't, it was simple. I mean, just show up, do it every day, you know, take it one day at a time, but it wasn't easy, but it, but it made everything better. And that was the beauty of that first mile is even how, no matter how hard it was, it was simple, it, but it wasn't easy, but it made everything better. So and, what, um, like, what point, like, so you, you're at Hawaii, you have the drink, the Ironman's going on. Was that, that wasn't when you decided that you wanted to be, a, uh, you know, 
you, you wanted to be an Ironman, right? Like, was that no. it? No. Yeah, no. In fact, it was a, a few months later when I actually saw, I was watching the Ironman on television after that trip. And I saw the Island of Hawaii came on and I think it was still, it was still on my mind because it was fresh there. And I was so obsessed with Hawaii because it was just, it was where I wanted to live. It, it was this beautiful place. And so anything that came on television that showed this, you know, beautiful scenery was, was amazing. So you saw the lava flows in slow motion, and then you see the coastline on, 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 on the television screen. And, and I was watching this and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm bought in. And then the voice comes on, you know, it's Al Trotwig's voice, you know, who does all of that, did all that sports stuff, uh, you know, back in the day. And, and he was narrating this, this, this show. And he just said, and he just starts going into it and just saying like, you know, the Ironman world championship on Hawaii. And, uh, and I'm listening just like you were to that, to those distances. And he was like saying 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, 26 mile run. And then I was, I was listening to that. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of distance. How many days do they, does it take them to do that? And they're like all in one day. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> so that's like, that's crazy. Those people are crazy. And then, you know, I kept watching and I, I remember just watching uh, these seemingly normal people crossing the finish line. Some of them with significant challenges. I mean, some of, some of these people like John Blaze, who is, who, who is, you know, it's such an inspiration had ALS. He was, he, he had Lou Gehrig's disease and he said he would get to the finish line, even though his, his, his muscles were atrophying. And he said that he'd get there. And even if he had to roll across the finish line, you had, you know, Rick and Dick Hoyt, son and father, father and son team, who the father was pushing his son who had a cerebral palsy. He could not move his body. He was pushing him the entire distance. He was pulling him in the water, pushing him. Up. And I was just watching this. I'm like, wow, these people are, you know, they're normal. They're like accountants, they're firemen, they're, they're all sorts of different, but, but they're doing this amazing thing. How are they doing that? And then like as quickly, in the, and at that time, my mind being broken, my mind, you know, being actively alcoholic, actively anxious and, and, and living in that, you know, I, I, I entertained that thought for a moment. It popped up and I said, what if I could do that? And then as quickly as that came, it said, no way, you can't do that go back to drinking and feeling sorry for yourself and, and, and sitting on the couch. And, and so, you know, naturally I, I listened to the voice. I, you know, didn't think about it for quite a few years until I had that year of sobriety. And then I was sitting there and the environment was different. The environment was shifted. My mindset had shifted. I was the same person. I was in the same level of health made probably worse health because I was older and, and, and I'd been, you know, deteriorating my health for so much longer. Um, but I was sitting there and my mindset was so much more empowered. And I, I think it was some kind of divine intervention. I don't know what it was, but I, I think the conditions are right that I, that I remembered that day because I was thinking to myself, what can I do to change my body that can be extreme, that can really test me, that I can, that I can stay consistent with? How can I hold myself accountable? And then it came to me, I'm like, yeah, what about that? I remember that Ironman world championship. I remember being inspired by these people. I remember these people were doing this amazing thing. And then I, that same thought came up. What if I could do it? And with that empowered mindset, with that shift, that mindset shift that I had, it was like, yeah, why not? Why couldn't I do that? Mm -hmm. And then I, then that started the snowball rolling. I started researching. I started looking into it and I really wanted to do the one in Hawaii because that was the one that was, that resonated with me. That was the one I saw. I'm like, I want to do that one. So I just immediately looked up, how do you sign up for the Ironman world championship? And of course you can't sign up. You have to qualify. <laughs> and, um, and I looked at the qualifying times at the time and they were ridiculous. I mean, you'd have to like swim and, you know, swim at least a, a, or faster than an hour and 10 minutes. You'd have to bike well over 20 miles an hour. You'd have to run, you know, low seven minute miles for 26 miles after doing the bike ride. I was nowhere near that. I mean, I couldn't, I'd never even owned a road bike. I'd barely swam the length of a pool at any given time. I'd grown up surfing, but I never really swam. So I had to learn everything from scratch and take everything from the beginner mindset, which is kind of the genesis of, of where the book came from to, to really, uh, you know, to really adopt that beginner mindset to, and, and to, or the big beginner attitude to adopt the mi mindset of a pro and adopt the, the attitude of that final finisher of the, of the person of that true beginner. Mm. Yeah. 
So you just, you just jumped into the research, the literature of how yeah. to train your body to get to where you needed to be. Cause you weren't an athlete. You didn't, right. You know what I mean? Like you didn't really know what to expect or, or how to train. What was, um, what book, um, really helped or what author or, or who mentor like really guided you along that journey? So the, I had a couple of, of really great resources and I was very fortunate to actually be injured at the time. I had just had a, a shoulder surgery that was correcting my labrum. So I wasn't really even allowed to swim. Um, and, and I, and I wasn't allowed to really run or do anything hardcore because my experience with fitness in the past had always been, you know, go hard or go home or no pain, no gain. That's always what I hear. And that's always what I think I would have to do. That's why I always burned out. And I never, you know, I never, I always went back to old unhealthy habits, but in this case, I was forced into that humility. And so I, I picked up, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to look at, I research, you know, how to get started in triathlon. And I really quickly ran across what was called the iron war, which was between Dave Scott and Mark Allen. And this really resonated with me because Dave Scott was a triathlete who had won the Ironman world championship many times. Mark Allen throughout the course of the eighties had tried to catch Dave Scott never could, never could quite do it. Always burned out or always uh, bonked or, and, and always just never caught up with Dave Scott until he hired a coach named Phil Maffetone. Phil Maffetone taught him how to train with heart rate, train aerobically, do 90% of his training at a super easy pace. It, it, you know, so easy, in fact, that it just felt effortless, but he was training and conditioning his fat burning aerobic engine to have this enormous engine to do this crazy, you know, eight hour long sport, uh, so that he could do it better at, and, and have better efficiency than, than somebody like Dave Scott, the very next year after adopting those practices, he won the Ironman world championship and he proceeded to win it five more times, uh, throughout the course of the, of the 1990s. And that resonated with me as somebody who was able to really kind of transform that. And, and the fact that it was done with an, at an easy pace and done by monitoring your heart rate, that there was a specific governor there. It was just like, okay, there's a strategy. There's a framework to this. And that framework really does work if you're disciplined with it. And that's something that I can do is be disciplined. So, um, so I adopted that philosophy from of Phil Maffetone, read his book, which was called the, uh, big book of endurance training and racing. So that's by Phil Maffetone. And I actually, I actually uh, uh, used uh, Mark Allen as a coach for that first year to start to really learn how, and uh, and and that was super helpful. Mm. Well, what was your 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 plan for running? Right, like because mm -hmm. running is no joke. Like I, there was times where I hit, you know, I ran a half marathon and I was just like beat up. You know, like what was your training uh, regimen for that? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was challenging, uh, but it, but it was very simple. It was really what I had to do was keep my heart rate below 142 at that time, which was 180 minus my age. And that was my goal target. And what I realized very quickly when I started that process was that I couldn't run very fast at all without that, my heart rate being elevated above that. And so I would quickly elevate it out and then I'd have to walk and, and then I'd have to bring the heart rate down and then I'd start jogging really slowly again. It wasn't breaking a sweat. I was barely even, you know, breathing heavy. And I was thinking to myself, this is crazy. This is not working, but I realized just stick with the plan. And so it was a lot of walking at first, but over time, my running uh, pace improved under that heart rate so that the same effort, the same, at the same heart rate, I was actually running faster. So it just required that I, that I run more volume and, uh, uh, and that I grow that volume steadily only 10% per week. And I do it at a very slow pace. I mean, I was starting out running at like 13 minute miles. It was very ridiculous. And it took quite a few months to bring that down to a level where I was in the eight to nine minute mile range. And, uh, and, and yeah, that was, that was where I was feeling like I was starting to become a triathlete. Mm -hmm what does your body feel like? Like what's the easiest, I shouldn't say easiest part. What, what do you excel at? Which, which part? I pretty quickly started excelling at the bike. Uh, I didn't really know much how to do any part of it. So 
I think where I had the most background was, was probably running because I had jogged off and on, you know, and, and done a couple of like five, 10 Ks, even a half marathon, uh, before that time, just, just like you just kind of, you know, suffering through it. But, uh, uh, but I never really biked before. And, but as I trained on the bike, I fell in love with it. It was exciting, you know, and, and it was, it was thrilling. And I really did begin to, to do, to do really well at it. Uh, so that became my forte and I really learned how to train very effectively on that. And I think it, it, it really got to my, the engineer in me because, you know, I was learning about, you know, all of this, uh, air resistance, aerodynamics and how to set up my bike and my fit as, as, as efficiently as possible so that I could get there. So that, that, that obviously touched right on where my obsessive personality, uh, laid mm -hmm. to. <laughs> yeah. yeah the stories about the book are, are pretty great i mean i don't i probably look you know, i i would probably be doing the same things that you were doing just because it's like it's awkward for me like i mm -hmm. i've ridden mountain bike sure but like to i i watched the guys around here uh just my neighborhood ride bikes and it doesn't look very comfortable um no <laughs> you know what i mean and then to do that for 100 plus miles i mean to me that's torturous um how do you like when you get to the i'm reading like you know in between your chapters and you have mm -hmm. your experiences during the race races, right? Like in some of those are pretty, you know, like I feel your pain man. you know, like you're talking about, you know, having, you know, having to take a crap and you're out in the middle of the desert and you know, it's, you know, it's just painful, you know, and yeah. I'm listening, you know, I can, I'm, I can visualize everything that's you're going through. Like, how do you keep that, that mindset of like, I got to continue. Well, that's the beauty of this sport is because it, it, in my opinion, triathlon, especially the longer distance endurance sports, that any of those kinds of things mimic life so much, they almost amplify what we experience on a day to day, because we always want to achieve that that flow, that that flow state. But there are always barriers to that. There's always drama that hits in. There's always something. There's always an obstacle that comes in. There's always a daily challenge. All these fires that are coming in and interrupting our flow. Meanwhile, we're just trying to keep running. And that's why I kind of wanted to introduce that framework in the book of like, yeah, sometimes you have to hit that porta potty and, and things are struggling. You take that moment, but you get right back into it. And that's it, it. So it almost, you know, with, with that, it's challenging enough, but it's so accessible that anybody that wants to do it, anybody could do it, that it, it almost, you know, trains us for life and how to experience and stay in that flow within life to stay disciplined and to, and to reach those levels of flow. Mm. Yeah. That's um, it's like, once you get over those barriers, especially the, the runner's wall, like your body, you start feeling the endorphins and it like kicks in and then it takes you to a whole nother level. But mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to um, uh, some, some, some guys that have run like 50 mile races that have done like, um, bad water. Mm. And those are insane. Like the amount of training that you have to do, the amount of preparation Like you were talking about, a, a sports drink that you're, you, you know, you have to consume while racing. Like I, I, I chug a thing of water before I run and I don't think about water for the next, you know, six miles. And then I come back and I, you know, I crush some more, but you guys every 15 minutes have to be rehydrating because you're, you're sweating so much. Your body is just, you know, it's, it's trying to absorb every piece of, um, nutrition or, or, or any piece of like hydration it can get salt. Like these are all things I've never even thought about, like salt pills. Like what the heck's a salt pill? Like, yeah. like talk about that. Like what's the sports drink that you were drinking? Yeah, it's a, uh, so I make, I make my own and, uh, cause I saw that a lot of those sports drinks are super expensive and I won't name any names, but I mean, but they all pretty much have the same thing, maltodextrin or some kind of, you know, uh, uh, some kind of carbohydrate like that. But, uh, uh, but typically something like a maltodextrin and then like a table sugar, I mix table sugar in mine, which is cane sugar and, uh, um, and yeah, salt tabs. Uh, so I, I mix about 800 to a thousand milligrams of sodium plus magnesium and, and potassium into a, a sports drink with some cherry juice and yeah that's that's it it's it's super simple and it's simple calories 
I think people overcomplicate the nutrition aspect. A lot of times they, they say that, oh yeah, this type of carbohydrate is so much better than this one or anything like that. But really the simpler you can make these kinds of things, the better, mm -hmm. because over a long distance sport like this, uh, you know, anything that's, that's, that, that you're, you're going to be experiencing for these long periods of time, any additional variables is an opportunity for failure. So if you're going to be introducing, you know, a, an energy bar or, or something different or, or all of these different, you know, varieties, smorgasbord of food or, or the, on the race course, you're going to introduce a lot of different variables for failure. But if you can practice with one simple thing, and for me, it was just, you know, just this sports drink uh, that I would drink over the course of, you know, those that five hour bike ride. Uh, that was simple enough that I knew it was going in. And that was the only thing that was that was going in. Uh, not a lot of opportunity for failure right there. Mm. What's your least favorite part of the Ironman? Like, is it the swimming? Definitely the swim. Yeah. And that's true for most people, but it, it's, it's, I, I, I hate it and I love it. And the reason why is because it scares the crap out of me. Mm. And, and that's one of the things that's important. And another thing that's great about and, and true to life here is that, you know, the sport is just intimidating enough that it, it, it scares a lot of people away from it. it and, and it forces us to believe that it, it's impossible. When I look out, even now, when I look out into a body of water and I look out and I imagine 2.4 miles of swimming, or if I was at the world championship and I was sitting on the Kona shoreline, looking out at the body glove boat, a mile, 1.2 miles away that I would have to swim around and come back to. And I see the water swelling and the chop and everything like that. And that amount of water between me and, and it, and probably the number of sharks that I imagined were under the water there. Uh, you know, it, it was scary. Um, mm. and I haven't, you know, having that anxiety, it was amplified because my, you know, my fear response is, is, is elevated in those senses. Mm. But the fact that I can approach that and it takes me just a few percent beyond my comfort zone, always, uh, you know, always helps to expand that comfort zone for me and make me at least stronger. As I do that, every time I, I can, I can put myself in a situation where I'm, where I'm, where I'm doing something that scares me, uh, just a little bit, you know, not jumping out of planes or, doing things like that. Cause I don't, that doesn't, you know, that's just too far, but it just a little bit, all you need to do is a little bit. And it, it, it expands that comfort zone. It makes us stronger, makes us more resilient because we are so resilient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love David Goggins book. Um, you know, can't hurt me. I love it. I mean, the guy is just a monster. He's amazing, but not everyone wants to be a Navy seal or, or do the, you know, do the, do the extreme things that he does or push ourselves to that level. Knowing that we can is awesome because that tells us that we can do certain things, but all we need, we don't need to go that to that level. All we need is just to push ourselves 5% beyond our comfort zone on a regular basis. And that is enough to, to expand what we're, what we're doing as long as we're pushing past that. Yeah. He's an outlier. He is, yeah. uh, he is not the average uh, right. for sure. <laughs> right. But that's, you know, a, a lot of where the, the mean is right. The mean, the, the, you know, where the, the, <laughs> Where everybody's at where everybody clusters at in the graph is like as long as you can be better than what you were that's the, mm -hmm. that's the goal right like and it's funny with swimming the ocean like i was I, I heard this somewhere like the ocean like to me it scares us because it like to me it's like our unconsciousness like our mm -hmm. unconscious mind like it's so deep and vast and it's dark and we don't know what's out there and like we're out there swimming and it's like our our conscious mind is out there like in our unconscious and we're just so scared of the unknown to surrender to that and to go out there and swim you know two miles in this unknown current of like fast you know sharks and all these things under or undertow or rip riptide or whatever you want to call it um all these things that can just take your life i mean that right there i mean like i i i used to lifeguard and we used to swim out in the ocean and i hated it right like if like swimming with the current wasn't bad. Right. But it's like when you get out there and you're, you're, you just got done, you know, exercising already and you got to go out there and you got to swim some more. Like we weren't, we weren't even swimming a mile. We were just, you know, a 10th of a mile or something, mm -hmm. but just like my anxiety would just spike when I had to go out there because I don't know what's out there and you feel something against your leg. And you're like, what is that? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's so intimidating because you can't see it. You just kind of, trust yourself that you know you know what i'm just going to swim and just go and, and we ultimately survived that 
And then that gives you confidence to parlay that into something else. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, look at your life, right. As an example, right. Like you were not an athlete and now you're writing a book about an iron man, right? Like that's incredible, right? Like you're, you were battling alcoholism, right. And you were able to, um, I, I don't want to say combat and I don't want to say, you know, conquer that, but you are conquering that you're mm -hmm. every day fighting that battle and you're parlaying that confidence of being sober into this arena of being an athlete, which you had no previous experience in. And that's parlaying that, that confidence into something else in your life. I mean, it just, it seems like our lives, once you start building that confidence, it's like this momentum that you can start putting into other aspects of your life, which rounds us up, rounds us out into, you know, fuller human beings of, of, um, you know, actual self-actualization almost, right? Like that, that, um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know what I mean? Like you start actually self-actualizing each step of the way up the pyramid. And it's like, you know, you might be in the dark night of the soul, like you were, and you might get in insp inspired to go to, to work out. And that gives you momentum to, to get better at your job or, or, or go look for a new job or go back to school. And then that gives you momentum. I mean, it just, it over, like it, it spills over. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, it, it's so true. And I, I, I want to, and, and that's, that's the central message I want to share with everybody who's still struggling with that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, 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 I never, I've never gotten over anxiety. I've never overcome it. You know, people have introduced me as somebody who's overcome anxiety and I haven't, I still have it. I had a panic attack two weeks ago because that's just, it's what I have. But transcendence is one of my favorite words because we have the ability to rise above it. And that's what transcendence is, is rising above what we are any day, every single day, we can rise above something like alcoholism and get, become something better for it. every day. We can rise above our anxiety and become something better for it. And if we're feeling a sense of hopelessness, and I know there's a lot of feelings of hopelessness in the world right now for many, many people, many people who have had external or, or environmental issues that have, uh, um, you know, have affected them. Many who, who have, who may seemingly have great lives, but internally they're, they're tormented. And I just want to offer to them that where it seems hopeless, where it seems like there is no way out. I've been there. I've been in that cell thinking to myself that there was no way out, that I was hopeless, that the only way out was to, to end it all. But where I'm at now, man, the miracle beyond that, if we can just embrace the idea of taking that one step at a time to, of really making the steps forward to, to just to, to let go and, and get the help we need because it's out there, man, the miracle beyond that is great. It's not easy. There's simple solutions to all these things. It's not easy, but it's worth it. It is mm -hmm. worth it. So where, where, where are you going now? You know, like where, where's your next step? So I, I work for, uh, I actually, um, run a family business that, that I'm still running. So I'm kind of, that's kind of what I do on, on, uh, you know, for, for my, for my real life, this is more of my fun life, but, <laughs> but what I, um, what I'm trying to, uh, uh, what I'm trying to do and, and, and build is, is there's a lot of people out there that are experiencing anxiety. Um, and it's a relatively new phenomenon that we can actually talk about it in the open. And that's such a good thing. And I really do believe that anxiety and some of these experiences with anxiety can be a superpower. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, is to help people that want to achieve more in their lives, recognize that there is a way that we can go from fear to flow. So I, you know, I'm, I'm toying with that idea. I'm, I'm building some frameworks around that and uh, continuing to coach triathletes and helping them, helping especially beginners to get into the sport and realize that from, from at least the level of athleticism. And uh, hopefully we can apply that to the rest of their lives as well. Mm. Oh, I love that. So, so people understand your story more. So uh, <laughs> you became a triathlete, right? You completed Ironman's. Mm -hmm. you're now coaching them and you're looking back on your life and, and I hear service, right? Like you want to be more, more of service to, to 
to individuals, not with just anxiety, but to everyone, right? But anxiety is a huge, I, I deal with anxiety all the time. I think it's, you know, um, anxiety used to save our lives back in the day, you know what I mean? When tigers were roaming around free, like it, it saved us, but now it's a totally different world and, and our anxiety is different. Um, how can people like f- take from this interview, this conversation, some, some important um, techniques in dealing with anxiety? Is it just, do I have to be a, a, a triathlete? Do I have to be an Ironman? Like, you know what I mean? Like that's your story, right? Adam, right. that's your story. But me who I, who deals with anxiety on a regular basis, like what are some techniques that I can in, implement in my life? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, one of ultimately one of the, the biggest, like Tony Robbins will say that, that one of our biggest, uh, uh, drivers in our lives is the idea of of wanting to be fulfilled. And that's absolutely true. So defining at least what you want out of life, what you truly want, if nothing was an obstacle, it is, is really a first step of, of knowing that. And if we want to address anxiety in particular, there's anxiety in the moment, which is the panic attacks, the anxiety we're feeling at any given time, the butterflies, what's making us nervous, what's, what's worrying us right now. And there's certainly tools that can work with that. Uh, but those are reactive tools and, and, you know, I could share some of those, but the primary tools you want to work with first are really the proactive ones, the armor that you want to build to help yourself to gain more courage through that anxiety, because the, the idea of being brave or, or being courageous in life or, or, or moving forward with progress towards growth is not a lack of fear. It's just being able to acknowledge fear and, and move forward anyway. And I believe that that starts at the very first point of waking up in the morning. And that's where you have to own your day. Too many of us wake up first thing in the morning. We, we scramble out of bed because our alarm woke us up. We brush our teeth and we get ready. And and then we, and then we keep, we go to work and we, we start our day ignoring the simple fact that that is the, that is the one time where we need to frame that day for ourselves. And if we do that every single day, whether it be through a breathing, breathing exercises, like, you know, there's all sorts of great breathing exercises that can help empower us Wim Hof or just simple box breathing or, or breathing through our nose and, 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 and just having an exercise of that, an empowering, uh, meditation or something like that of every morning, some kind of discipline that we can have as a morning routine that empowers us. Uh, that's, that's the first step is just framing ourselves and knowing that that's not going to make us perfect 100% of the day, but it's going to gradually elevate us in in that way. And then, you know, really throughout the day, it's just, it's, it's acknowledging anxiety for what it is throughout the day. It's a warning system and it's not always rational, especially in this day and age where we're hit with so much information, so much stimulus. We're not conditioned evolutionarily speaking. You'd mentioned like we were you know, we, anxiety was good for us or fear was good for us because it would help us to run away from tigers and dinosaurs and all that. But now it's just like constant information, constant, you know, constant stimulus that's given that that's making anxiety more prevalent. So it is about, you know, recognizing it, recognizing that, that it's, uh, uh, what it's trying to tell us, maybe putting down the, putting down the phone. Uh, I know that's a hard one, but that's a big one, putting down the news and the social media, and, uh, and really taking the time to acknowledge and be, be uh, obsessively present. So, um, so those are kind of the reactive and, and simple, I think simple first approaches to, to doing that. If you can, if you can get a manage, get a hold of your day first thing in the morning, and then, you know, tackle each anxiety attack as it comes, um, then that's, that's really the best, best way to approach it. Mm. I love it. Adam, how can people get a hold of you? How can they find out more about you? Yeah, my uh, website is the best way to find out what's going on, which is www.adamhilltry.com. And uh, yeah, that's where I have everything. I'm also on the social medias. That's the same handle for Instagram, Adam Hill Try, and uh, YouTube and all that good stuff. Amazing. Adam, I can't thank you enough for joining the show, man. This went by quick. Yeah, man. Thanks, Trey. I appreciate it. This is awesome. 